A promise is a pledge to provide a service. I'm not promising you'll be entertained. I'm not promising we're the best show in town. What I am promising is to teach you biblical truth with practical application. I promise to teach men to fight for their faith, their families, and their futures through the word of God. I'm Douglas Gumby, lead pastor of the Contenders Church. Join us in the fight at contenderschurch.org. Um, no heavy revs today. I want to keep it very simple. Uh, keep it uh, as understandable as possible. James chapter 5, verse 15 and 16 is where we'll be for the majority of our text today. Uh, it says in verse 15, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I, I found in life that the toughest thing that I ever or we will ever have to do is tell somebody I can't do something. To admit weakness. It's the hardest thing that you will ever have to do. You will lie and try before you say you can't. Amen, praise the Lord. Can't is something, uh, it, it exposes our weaknesses. It exposes and it identifies imperfections in us. It says that we are not skilled yet in that place or in that area, and, and it's something that we have not tried because we probably failed at it a few times. Can't is something that the believer can't afford to live with because my Bible says, just like your Bible, I can do all things, but it don't just stop there. Because we take all things and we give ourselves creative license to do <laughs> all things. And all things are, are, are permitted but not permissible. We don't want to do what God doesn't want us to do. We don't want to fall outside of the will of God trying to do all things. We have to ask God, what is your will for my life and what would you have me to do? So let's finish that scripture. It does tell us that we can do all things, and it gives the, uh, it, the ability to do all things, but it doesn't give us the creative license to do all things. We've got to finish that text in context. Through Christ who strengthens me. When I choose to do what I say I can't do, but I attempt to do what he allows me to do, do does he give me permission through his will to do what I feel I can't do? Our strength comes as a result of relinquishing our limited strength into the more than capable hand of God. The one thing that you and I will always learn, if you haven't learned it yet, I guarantee you life will teach you, is that when you can't do something, say, God, I've done everything I know how to do. Here I am. I humbly submit to you, and you will find, as many have found, he's been waiting on you to move out of the way in the first place. So for the time that is ours to share, I want to speak from this simple topic, the prayer of faith. In order to understand the prayer of faith, there are three things that you have to have in place, and I'm only going to go systematically through this text because this text shows us what you have to do in order to pray an effective prayer of faith. Number one, you must eliminate all doubt. You must eliminate all doubt. We read in the scripture a few weeks ago, which was also reminiscent of a text that we all know, that when, when Peter walked into the room to heal that little girl, what did he do with everybody else? If you weren't 100% believing, he put them out. It's okay to remove yourself. I, I had a conversation this morning and I realized that the place that I'm in, it was a conversation that we had about where we are and how, how God uh, uh, separates us and puts us in a place of learning, of growing, of maturing, of molding. And in that place, you will find that you don't believe like you used to believe and God is growing you to another place. I feel as though as a pastor and as a leader, I stand up here and I feel like I'm talking Mandarin Chinese to myself because I don't understand half stuff that come out of my mouth. 
but I'm watching God mature and develop and reassign what it is he's called me to do, and it's not like what I'm used to. But what I'm learning to do is get out of my way and forget what I know and say, God, you're in charge anyway. What do you want to do? So I'm having to eliminate all doubt. Where is the doubt? It's right here. The, the doubt is inside of you. The doubt ain't your haters. You don't have haters. Ain't none of us that great. The doubt is not those who talk about you, who scorn you. Those are just people who really don't have much to do. And you're paying attention to it because the doubt that's inside of you is defining what others are when they aren't. Eliminate all doubt. James 5, 14 and 15. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sin, he shall be forgiven. The greatest mistake that you and I can do is give too much power to men. I stand here on this elevated platform, but I, I feel the most humble in my life because I'm afraid of what elevation can do, if I can be honest. I'm afraid that I, as I've watched and I've I've been changed by elevation. I'm afraid to take those steps as a leader to put myself out there for somebody to pat me on the back and say, you did a good job. I've come to a place where it's about God or it's about nothing. And if I have to sit at a house or, or live a humble life for the rest of my life and that's what I have to do to remain humble, that's what I will do. Because I don't want people to make the mistake of putting a person on the pedestal and forgetting God. This is commonly done in the general, general population with those in a position of authority and leadership. We have given great power and authority to men while failing to acknowledge the everlasting power of God. Our job and our goal today is to eliminate all doubt. When you eliminate all doubt, you move men out of the way. There's one thing that, is, that can be carefully observed here. The saving of, of the sick is not ascribed to the anointing with oil. The saving of the sick is ascribed to the prayer of faith. It says, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he hath committed sins they shall be forgiven. Now, it just said in, in verse 14, is any sick among you? Let him call on the elders of the earth, of their church. Then let them come and, and with anointing oil, lay, lay hands and pray for them. But your healing is in the prayer of faith. If, if, if I come and you call, here's the thing. <laughs> in order to eliminate all doubt, you've got to move me and out of the way. Praying over the sick must proceed and, and be accompanied by a lively faith. There must be faith in the person who is praying and there has to be faith in the person being prayed for. Matthew 9 and 22 will give us a, 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 an example of this prayer of faith and the ability of the person being prayed for to hold on to their faith. The woman with the issue, but Jesus turned about him and when he saw her, he said, daughter, be of comfort. Thy faith. She said in herself, if I could get to Jesus, I could be made whole. Right? I'm going to give you another example. I'm going somewhere. I'm going to show you something. Matthew 15, 28, the woman with, whose daughter was vexed with the devil. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt, and that her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Mark chapter 10, blind Bartimaeus, and Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, 
thy faith. He was sitting there at the pool of Siloam. He was sitting there, and this was the instance in the Bible where, where, where he was sitting at the edge of the pool, and the person who could get in the pool when the angel stirred the waters was the first to get healed. And he was the one sitting there for 38 years, right by the edge of the pool, and somebody always beat him to it. But Jesus prayed over him. He said, get up and go your way. He, 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 he got up and went his way, and he said to him, your faith has made you whole. Why am I saying this? Why am I telling you to eliminate all doubt and tell you that your faith can make you whole? I said it for this manner. Is there any sick among you? The Bible says, let them call for the elders of the church. Here's the thing. When you get sick, when you get a cold, I don't know it unless you call me. I'm in touch with God, but not that close. If I can be real. I don't, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't always, as, as some of us in the church vernacular say, drop you in my spirit. Can we just be up front today? I, I, I don't walk around on a cloud. I don't float. I don't hover. I have to change clothes and bathe because I'm human. I don't want to be dehumidified or whatever that word is. No, that's got to do with humidity. No, that uh, dehumidified, that's what I was finna say. All right, I fixed it, but I did it publicly. How about that? I don't want to be exalted to be something that is impossible for me. Is it possible for God to put you in my spirit and for me to pray for you without you calling, without you texting? Yes. But to help me out, could you pick up the phone? Could you shoot me an email? <laughs> because it's not what I can do for you anyway. I can stop whatever I'm doing, run to your aid, pray for you, and you still be sick. If you don't have faith, if you haven't eliminated all doubt, let's look at this. Mark chapter 2, uh, the paralytic through the roof. When Jesus saw their faith, his friends were carrying him around on a bed everywhere he went. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, son, your sins are forgiven you. Time out. Wait. Hold up. Wait a minute. The man's sick of the palsy. He's been this way for a minute. And he said, your sins are forgiven you. In our text today, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Let's pay attention to this. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the text says, and if he has any sin, God will forgive him. Let's look at it like this. Sin makes us the perfect imperfection. When God created us, when God created man, he said everything that he created was good. Sin is imperfection. So sin is as we sin, as we continue to live and are affected by sin, it makes us the perfect imperfection. But faith does something because faith is the perfect repair tool. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, shall heal the sick. So the forgiveness of sin puts us in a place of wholeness. The problem is, We've got to stop with the sin. There he is again talking about sin because sin is wrapped up in everything that you and I do. I'm going to show you. When praying the prayer of faith, you've got to eliminate all doubt. That means that sin intensifies doubt. God, I would come to church, but I. God, I, I want to serve you, but I don't think you would let me. Why? Because sin registers doubt within us. When we come into this place, we should not come in here uh, uh, heavy laden and guilty. We should come into this place saying, God, here I am again. Redeem me again. Bring me back anew. I know I'm not perfect, but I won't stop until you put me in the place that you desire for me to be. That's how you eliminate doubt. Secondly, you must be strengthened in your weakness. James 5, 16, the first port, portion. 
confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. If we can be honest in this room, most of us know exactly where we are. You don't need the Holy Ghost to follow me to give you a prophetic word and speak in a language that I don't talk. You know where you are. You know what your biggest hurdles are. You know what your, your toughest challenges are. You live with you every day. The truth of the matter is, we've got to be strengthened where we're weak. We've got to become strong where we're weak. When, bro, he used to work me out. He used to take me to the gym, and, you know, for them, them couple of hours, you know, he, he my buddy, he my brother. I love him to death. I trust him with my family. I can't say that about everything and everybody. But for them two hours, I couldn't stand him. You know why? Because he pushed me where I didn't want to be pushed. He has this thing called Tyson's. Tyson's is something that Mike Tyson did every day while he was in prison. That's where the name came from. He would take a quarter or something and put it on the ground, right? And he would bend down and pick one up. He'd lay down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And for every one, you put down how many objects? One, second one, two. You bend down, you pick up two, right? Third one, same, so on and so forth. By the time you get to five, you won't kill everybody. You know why? Because it pushes what you don't want to be pushed. It affects what you don't want to affect. What God's word does for you, it, it, it strengthens you where you want to remain weak. Let, let's be honest in the room. If you can make it to heaven and keep that little sin, would you? Don't lie. Don't lie. Don't lie. I got a nod here, nod back like, yes, I would, Jesus. But what God's word does, every time you come in here, Pastor, tell my sin. God, I can't stand him. But I sure appreciate that word because I needed to hear that. We don't need a psychic, a prophet, or a palm reader. We need accountability. You don't need me to tell you you dealing with God is revealed to me and how I do that for you. You need accountability. You need to say, this is where I am. This is my struggle. And it's tough for me to say this to you, but I'm going to reveal it anyway. When I pick up the phone and I call, bro, no disrespect, I don't care what he doing. For them two minutes, I need him to talk to me because my mind has me fried. We need accountability. The issue is that most people can't face where they are, so we create alternative lifestyles. And that's why the church has created these atmospheres for people to feel comfortable. I am not concerned with your comfort more than I am your finished product of making it into heaven. I'm not concerned with whether or not you squirm in a pew when I say these key button uh, issues. I'd rather you squirm and be upset, but if you come back, I got another chance to deal with you. I've noticed a trend. The individual has to make the, merc the, fo the first move before anything else. You have to make the first move. It says, if any of you are sick, you call. That's in the text. I ain't making that up. It says, it says in the, in the next part, confess your faults. Who got to confess their faults? You ain't got to sit in a confessional, but you confess your faults. You tell what your faults. Now, here's the thing. The faults or this recognition of oneself is an admission of weakness. It is it's going to be one of the most difficult because, remember I said, the toughest thing you're going to ever have to do is to tell somebody that you can't do something. It's, sometimes it's not that you can't. It's cho you choose not to. Amen, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Our weakness pertaining to God is not a detriment. Our weakness pertaining to God is to our benefit. The success of the prayer of faith is this. The Lord is the one who decides if the person is capable or fit for deliverance. 
The, the success of the prayer of faith is this. The Lord decides if the person has anything to do further on earth. And the Lord decides if the person has committed sins, that those sins will be forgiven. You can't come to me and I heal you. You can't come to me and I deliver you. I don't hold that power. But I can go before the Lord with you. I can be accountable to you. We, have, we can be accountable to one another. And together we can grow in the faith and be stronger. Sometimes sickness is sent as a punishment and removed. You ever thought about that? Check it out. John chapter 5, verse 5 through 8 and 14. Jesus healed the impotent man, the man who had little ability to move on himself. For himself. In, in verse 5 it says a certain man was there which had an infirmity 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lie and knew uh, that he had been now uh, alone. Will you be made whole? And the impotent man answered him and said, sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me in the pool. But while I am coming, another step down before me. Jesus said, rise, take up your bed and walk. After which Jesus found him in the temple in verse 14. Check this out. Wait a minute. Here's Jesus. This is the picture I need you to see. This man is sitting beside the pool and he's wanting healing all of this time. And Jesus said, do you want to be made whole? You ain't come. You, you waiting to do what is, has been the tradition. But do you really want to be made whole? We've come to church all of this time, and, and if the altar call has been given, we run down snobbing and crying, but do you want to be made whole? I'm going to blow your mind in a few minutes, because when you go down to verse 14, I did not know because I stopped reading as most Christians do. We stopped reading after the miracle, but you got to go back into the instruction, because verse 14, Jesus not only goes into the temple, the young man not only goes to the temple, but Jesus goes now to find him in verse 14. He says this, afterwards Jesus found him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, you are made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come on you. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me sin makes us sick? Sometimes sin is given, a, the, the sickness is given as a punishment, and the forgiveness allows that punishment to be lifted, and we still want to play with sin. We still don't want to be accountable to no church. I read an interesting article about those who are done with the church yesterday. They are done. They are sick of the church because the church has played too many games. But understanding this, you fail to realize you are the church. The church ain't me standing up here preaching to you. You are the church. So how can you be done with... Come on back, come on. Sometimes sickness is sent to remind us and to remain. Sometimes... What we go through, we're going to have to go through because it keeps us in a place of striving after God. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8 and 9, Paul's thorn in the flesh. For this thing I besought the Lord three times that it might be depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. I think I just put a T on weakness. I heard it. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Sometimes the things that you go through are meant for you to go through because if you didn't go through them, you would not be where you are, nor would you make it where God wants you to be. This is not about ministering to the nation. Sometimes you got to go through stuff in your own home just so you can stay in your own home. You got to go through stuff on your job, but then never be able to make enough to get away because God wants you there. And we always say, Lord, deliver me. Bring me out of this. But what if he wants you in it? Have you asked him that? 
Is this what you want from me? Is this your purpose? Is this your will? How can you get the glory out of my life in this? I said to God on many occasions, I hate this. I can't stand where I am. Because at that moment where I was, wasn't where I wanted me to be. And I was just being honest. But I found that's where he wanted me to be. And when I found that's where he wanted me to be, I shut my mouth and I stayed and I enjoyed the process. And that's when I learned some of the greatest lessons. When praying the prayer of faith, you eliminate all doubt. You understand that your prayer, you're, you're strengthened in your weakness. And lastly, there's a beneficial request. James 5, 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Effectual fervent prayer is proactive. I'm, I'm, I'm saying something here I want you to really get. Effectual fervent prayer is not, as most of us do, reactive. When we go through and we're in the middle of the process, then we want to get down and say, oh, shamana, namana, namana, help me, Jesus. <laughs> Effectual, fervent prayer, understand when it comes. When, when you ask for forgiveness of your sins, when you've confessed your faults, what is a fault? We got to understand what these things are. When, when the Bible says, me confessing my sins to you ain't going to change my sin. You just know what my sin is. I don't have no problem with that, but I need you to understand something. I don't need you running around telling all my stuff, neither. Don't Bill Cosby me. I know I'm wrong for that. I'm working on it. But here's the thing. If we can be honest with ourselves, the prayer of, pray, pr prayer of faith can heal the sick. And the Bible says, if there's any sin, they will be forgiven. Then it says this, confess your faults. What is a fault? A fault is the habit that you have which leads to sin. There's certain positions and certain things I can't put myself in because they lead me to sin. It's not a sin to have a fault. It's not a sin to have a habit. But does that habit lead to sin? And so with accountability, when, when I see that habit forming, pick up the phone. Call somebody. Say, here I am. Uh, I know you're busy. Just stay on the phone. Just talk to me. Ain't nothing going on. Ain't nothing to happen. But talk to me. It, it helps to be accountable because here you are expressing I'm at a weak point in my life and I'm leaning on somebody when I normally don't do it, but this is going to grow me. This is going to strengthen me. This is going to put me where God wants me to be. Remember, it's not a confession of sin, it's a confession of fault. The confession is concerning our misguided and dangerous habits which cause us to sin. The confession is between Christians. If you ain't saved, I ain't accountable to you. Why? If you're not leaning on God for your everything, why should I be accountable to you? And you go to church all the time. But if your life don't line up with the word, you ain't accountable neither. Tight but is right. So this accountability, this confession is between believers to keep us from allowing these habits to lead us to sin. This confession is not as the Catholics would in a confessional to a priest. Where, where persons have injured one another, acts of injustice must be confessed to those against whom they've been committed. This week was the weirdest week because when I started studying this message, it blew my mind. I had a gentleman that came up and he, he said, I want to buy you a coffee, and we had a great conversation, and I thought that's what the message was going to be about. Nothing, none, none of that is going to make the message. What does make the message is this, family. I was sitting on Facebook. 
I saw a family member I haven't talked to in four years. Face popped up. I felt guilty. You know why? Because I, the preacher, the pastor, the husband, the father, the leader, <laughs> treated my family like dirt when they needed me the most. And I sat there and looked at their face. And the conversation that I was having at the time didn't even matter anymore. And I sat there and I looked and I looked. And I said, you know what? This is my family. And I ain't talked to them in four years. And I think it's time I reach out. And I made this determination. If they don't respond, at least I tried. If they don't respond, I can't say I can't talk. So you know what I did? Before I did any other piece of work, I sat there. And I reached out. And I didn't come all pompous and holier than thou. I said, man, this your family. When I saw your face, it blew my mind because you're my family. And I apologize for leaving you hanging when you needed me the most. I apologize for not communicating with you and Xing you out because I didn't like what they said you did. I apologize for my weakness of calling myself a leader and treating you like nobody. That was one of the toughest things that I had to do. And I'm still waiting. I'm still praying. And if he doesn't respond, I'm okay. But I'm, my prayer is he does. My prayer is I can speak to my family, spend time with my family, get to talk to my family. And you know what I found out? That ain't the only person I'm going to have to talk to. And you know what you're going to find out? <laughs> you're going to have to do the same thing too. Because when it comes to this Christianity thing, it ain't by church folk. It ain't by haters. If you ain't getting along with family, that affects a lot. That affects a lot. To call ourselves believers of the most high God and the, the second command, which is the greatest, is to love one another. And we hate each other. Now, I can be honest and say I don't hate nobody. But I can be honest and say I hope they don't never cross me. <laughs> don't laugh at me, John. You just stirred up. <laughs> the purpose of confession, our, confessing our faults is to give the hearer specifics to pray about. If I don't know what to pray about, I'm going to simply pray, God, your will be done. That's all I can do. But if you're strong enough to overcome where you're weak and say, this is my weakness, would you pray with me about this? Here's the thing. My job is to take what you asked me to pray about and pray about it. And when I finish praying about it, forget about it. The problem is we hear it, we process it, and then we keep talking. And do you know that Proverbs tells us that the greater than the seven sins is gossip? Read it for yourself. Greater than the seven sins. Six things are, 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 are the Lord does despise. The seventh is an abomination. And if you keep reading on down, running your mouth is greater than all of those. You know why? Because running our mouth turns us against our brothers and our sisters. Running our mouth has almost destroyed the makeup of the church. Folk don't want to come to church because they're sick and tired of you running your mouth. Y'all don't change my message. The, com the purpose of confession our faults is to give the hearer specifics about what to pray what to pray, not to gossip, not to remember and bring up in a heated moment of fellowship, <laughs> but to pray and release it to God and allow God to finish the work in them just like he's doing in you. Where would believers be if we could share our struggles with other believers? Think about it. Where would the church be? The church would actually flourish 
if people didn't have the view of the church that we've given them. Remember, effective, effectual fervent prayer is proactive. It's before sin. It's before the habits take hold. It's not reactive after the fact. It is preventative if properly ap applied. The results would be phenomenal. And today, my ultimate goal is to pray with you an effective, fervent prayer. To challenge us to look at ourselves. To challenge us to say, God, is there anything in me that doubts you can do anything through me? Is there anything in me that I can't handle because I'm weak and you are trying to push me, but I keep getting off the regimen? Is there anything in me that you want to reveal in me that will be beneficial because I come to you and I request that you do it? Today, our effective, fervent prayer starts with us. I'm going to pray, but I'm going to ask you to pray as well. Father, here we are. We are gathered here in this room taking a look at us, taking a look at who we are. The first thing we acknowledge, God, is though we believe, though we say we have faith, we still doubt. I don't know whether our doubt is in you or doubt in ourselves, but that doubt is apparent. God, forgive us of doubting. Forgive us for not following through and allowing faith to supersede our doubt. Remove from us everything that would cause us to doubt your ability, your strength, and what you've put inside of us. Secondly, God, I simply pray that you continue to push us where we're weak, that you continue to grow us where we need growth, that you continue to cover us where we keep uncovering ourselves. That area, those areas that we are weak, God, be our strength. Take us and put us on your plan. Allow us to walk with you, to see our weakness, to acknowledge our weakness, and work our way out of being weak. For your strength is perfect in our weakness. Your faith, our belief in you, is the tool that takes us from the perfect imperfection back into righteousness and wholeness. God, let this prayer, this prayer of faith that we pray today, not only heal physical sickness, but spiritual sickness as well. Where we've doubted, where we walked out of your will, where we walked clearly in sin, forgive us as individuals. Forgive me as a husband, a father, a leader, then a pastor. Forgive us as the body of Christ for not being the representatives of the gospel as you have declared in your word. And God, the benefit to this request is that first of all, you hear us, is that you acknowledge us, and that more importantly, you have the ability and the capability to do all these things that we've asked. More importantly, God, my prayer is that your will be done that you draw each individual in this place and those who will hear closer to you. Let us come into a place of understanding that you are in control, that you are our power and you are our strength and that without you, we have nothing. God, I simply honor you today. I give you praise. Thank you for your son, Jesus. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.